Hi everyone. Welcome to the sixth webinar for MedTech Innovator Asia Pacific's uh, live broadcast. So this time our topic will be on industrial design and human factors engineering. Here we have our panelists and Paul today will be our moderator. So I'll leave it to Paul to introduce um, the panelists later. I'll now pass it on to Frederick to say a few words and then he'll pass it on to Paul. So Frederick. Great. Thank you, Sakina. Good morning. Good evening. Welcome, everyone. This is, um, uh, as Sakina said, our sixth webinar in this, in this series, um, in the MedTech Innovator Asia Pacific webinar series. Uh, the topic is industrial design and human factors engineering. Um, it will be the usual format, 60 minutes of panel discussion, live streamed on YouTube, followed by 30 minutes of Q&A for our 2020 uh, Accelerator cohort. Uh, please ask your questions using the, uh, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, and uh, Paul will address those uh, questions towards the end of the, the panel discussion. If you have any comments during the, uh, the discussion itself, uh, please use the chat function. Final word for me, um, next week, don't miss our um, webinar on clinical trial design and management. Same time, Wednesday, 10 o'clock Singapore time. With that, um, enjoy the, uh, the session and I'll hand over to um, MedTech Innovator CEO, Paul Grant. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, glad to be here, everybody. Hi, I'm Paul Grant, CEO here at MedTech Innovator. For those of you who haven't met me before uh, and are, are not familiar with MedTech Innovator, if you're watching this on our YouTube stream, uh, MedTech Innovator is a accelerator for medical technology. Those are devices, diagnostics, and digital health. Uh, we've been running our programs in the U.S., Europe, and Asia Pacific for the last eight years. Um, Asia Pacific is the last two years. So we, we started in 2019. 2020 is our second year in Asia Pacific. First year, however, with an accelerator. Um, and as Frederick mentioned, this is our accelerator series. Um, it's designed to answer questions from our cohort on a number of topics and give them access to experts in the field. So today we're gonna to be talking about industrial design and human factors engineering. And we've got an excellent panel for you. We've got two panelists um, who are experts in the field. Um, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. We're gonna start off with Gary Haywood, who's head of business development at Design and Industry. Gary, you wanna introduce yourself? Tell us a little about your background uh, and about your work at uh, DNI. Great, thanks very much, Paul, and, and thanks very much, Frederick and uh, Sakina, for inviting me to speak today. Um, I guess a little bit of background about myself is uh, I'm a product designer by training and have been for 30 odd years now. Um, while I was training, I, I uh, took a particular interest in, in understanding the, the business and, and, and realities of manufacturing and engineering. In fact, I found it very frustrating that I didn't know enough. So I found consulting a little bit constrictive for me very early in my career, and I, I immediately launched into um, business development and technical um, sales roles within plastics and industrial markets and spent a, a good deal of my career in, in that space as a designer. And it gave me a very healthy respect for, for all sectors associated with product development uh, regarding marketing and, and all of the nuances associated with manufacture of products as well too. So uh, over the years, I've, I've done several roles in that space, working in many markets and, and industries. Um, medical device is just one of them, automotive, um, high tech, right through to industrials, consumers, materials, handling and packaging. Um, I did a stint for uh, about four years with a, a local government body in a design um, education program for industry where we were running a lot of events. Uh, and I was doing mentoring and, and, uh, and managing programs and projects for um, for uh, manufacturers, primarily here around Melbourne and, and in Victoria and Australia, where we're based. Uh, the last five years, I've worked for design and industry, uh, and uh, we're uh, Australia's uh, largest um, product design consultancy. We have two studios, uh, one in Sydney and, uh, and one in, uh, in Melbourne, um, and the, the business was started 30 years ago as well. So we've been around a long time. Uh, the team consists largely and was founded by an industrial designer, a gentleman called Murray Hunter, who's still involved in the business. Um, and where very much our heritage is uh, industrial design and product design. 
we've been doing medical devices for, for probably up to 10 years now as, as a core part of our business. Uh, and we would uh, probably about, I would say, uh, a, a third to a half of our business would be medical device projects, the remainder industrial and, and other technology and consumer products. Uh, recently, probably in the last two years, we've, uh, we've managed to get ISO 13485 accreditation, um, so for medical device development, um, and uh, we've managed to then extend our, our offering to a lot of the, uh, the developers that incorporate a lot of those compliance activities. So we're very uh, experienced in, uh, in development of high-tech, cutting-edge, state-of-the-art medical devices. And I guess probably uh, one of the, the real um, points of difference that we, we like to, to, to talk to the market about is delivery. Um, design and industry excels at actually getting products out of our development cycle and into market. So we're very proud of our record in, uh, in actually uh, taking products for our clients, be they multinationals or startups, all the way to market. Um, and there's reasons that that, that occurs. And, and I hope during the course of um, the, this presentation today that I can share some of the, the insights into, into why we have that, that, that uh, wonderful success with our products. But uh, that's me. Very good. Well, we'll get into some of those details um, as we, uh, we talk more today. So thank you, Gary. Great background, um, really interesting and, um, and super relevant. So uh, let's move on then to uh, Yan Yin Lei. So uh, Yan Lin is VP of Business Development at Cambridge Consultants. Uh, Yan Lin, you want to tell us about yourself, your background, yeah. and your work at Cambridge Consultants? It's great. So it's nice to meet you all. My name is Yan Lin. Um, I, as I said, you know, I work for Cambridge Consultants as a VP of Business Development. And right now, I'm basically leading our commercial efforts here on the west coast of the United States. Um, but prior to that, I was leading APAC uh, business development for the company for the past five years. So I have experience in developing products for both, let's say, mature markets as well as developing world application areas. Um, I am a biomedical engineer by training, so I do have a technical background. Um, and Prior to this particular job, I was working in startups. So I know exactly how you guys feel. You know, early stage, you've got a million things pulling at you. But this, this thing, this amorphous thing called human factors is, is one of the things that you have to get to get on grips with pretty early. And that's probably one of the learnings I learned when I was um, running startups uh, quite a few years ago. And that's part of the experience that I hope to share. Now, as part of what I do at Cambridge Consultants, you know, I represent all our, our product development um, offerings. We are probably the largest um, uh, product development firm in the world at the moment. We are 850 full-time scientists, engineers, mathematicians, consultants. Um, we have been in business for about 60 years and about 30 of those years uh, we've been doing um, MedTech. So about 40% of our portfolio is, is MedTech, which equates to something like 200 to 250 projects a year. Um, so we are very, very experienced uh, in, in this category. And I personally specialize only in uh, medical technologies. So we are slightly different from, from Gary at, at DNI uh, in that we are sort of end-to-end uh, -end product development firm. So beyond the sort of um, more front end uh, sort of human factors design effort, we also go down further down the line into detailed design. And we can take basically an idea from a piece of paper, do all the detailed engineering, you know, create the design history file alongside all the way basically to transfer to manufacture. Um, and we support our clients as much or as little as they need. So, um, that's basically Cambridge Consultants. The vast majority of the projects that we do are class two or class three. They have a tendency to be first in class or best in the world of some kind. So they tend to be interesting, challenging um, products, which like many of you in this cohort are, are trying to get out into the world. And that basically brings up a whole different set of design challenges when you're trying to do something new for the first time. You don't have a precedent to base um, how you're approaching 
um, the, the project from. And so that's kind of where we specialize. Great, thank you. So, and thank you for that little bit of distinction between uh, DNI and Cambridge, which we'll get into more, I'm sure. So, so let's start off and, and talk a little bit about um, just kind of like setting the table for what human factors engineering even is. Um, you know, I find a lot of startups, you know, they just want to build a product that is going to solve whatever technical challenge or medical solution they're trying to address. They just want to make it work. Um, they don't think a lot about design. They kind of feel like, oh, you know, the design and the function and the form and all those things are all going to be things I have to really worry about later. Um, so maybe let's just start off first with kind of just a brief description of, of the discipline of of HFE, human factors engineering, and you know what that really means and kind of what it encompasses. Um, so, uh, so why don't I start off with um, with you, uh, Jan Lin, on that? Okay. So at CC, the term human factors, human centric design, user experience, we use interchangeably, and for us, it means that basically that human centered design team is responsible for the entirety of that user experience. And what that means is, is not only can they use it, but is it safe for use? Is it effective for that use? And hopefully as well, is it enjoyable or desirable to use? So this spans regulatory concerns, uh, commercial goals, clinical considerations, and it takes the whole product as a whole. You know, it's not just one component of, it has to work within that environment in that clinical workflow especially if it is in a clinical workflow. Um, and it's the full experience of the product lifetime. So it's not just something that you do once at the start of a program to get your design inputs, it's actually considering everything down the line, not, not just that initial touch point of how does it look. Good, um, and Gary, anything you wanna add on to that? I guess from a point of view of, of um, some of the business elements of the, uh, as well too. The the story that that you tell many stakeholders will be a, a very important uh, means of initially engaging people and, and bringing them into the understanding that you have of the of the benefits that your piece of hardware is actually going to bring to their day, their life, and and, and their work. And I, I have always seen a huge amount of value in getting that story right and, and being able to communicate it in the form of uh, if it needs to be a pitch or it needs to be something more intensive. The, the initial conversations that we have with founders often start very technically and, and, and more often than not in those very early conversations, the first thing we need to start doing is unraveling that and turning it into um, that user experience and elements around those human factors because what you're effectively doing is using that technology to bring about better, you would hope better, and, and new behaviours in those users. And it's absolutely critical that you get it right because it only takes one a stage of that that you get wrong um, for the, the, the product and, and, the, and the entire offering to fail. So... From our perspective, human factors is absolutely essential. It's the backbone to product development. It, it enables you to understand that new environment that you're aiming for. It enables you to put that peg in the ground from day one as to what those key drivers of, of features in your product that are going to ultimately win for you in the market. So I would say to you that it would be our starting point. It's our finishing point, And it's a key driver of everything in between. You know, um... Gary, you know, in your your intro when you were giving your background, I know you did some work in automotive as well. Um, and, and something, you know, I think about a lot when it comes to human-centered design, human factors, um, is how, you know, the experience that we've all had now in our cars um, or with our, um, our consumer goods, things like, you know, our laptops from Apple and, you know, on these really very well thought out um, designs and the thing, the expectations that consumer have um, are affecting and have affected, you know, industries like the medical industry and that people have an expectation now, um, even if you're not, you know, even if the nurse or the surgeon who's using the product didn't physically pay for it, they're still a user, right? They're still, um, they're still um, a human in the human centered design. So I guess the question I have is, is 
how has you know how have you seen like you know it broadly speaking how has how have advances in those kind of consumer industries impacted the expectations for uh, stakeholders in the uh, the medical industry especially in the context of you know Yan Lin what you were saying before about um, you know the workflow and considerations for how people use things so you know have the have the stakes been you know significantly raised over this last five years ten years and and maybe even speak to um, in specifically in Asia Pacific as well so uh, Yan Lin I'll start with you on that so I would say definitely but it's slow right this is a medtech is a very segmented diverse industry. I think that's over 5,000 product categories. So there are definitely areas within the industry that have taken this uh, consumerization of that design aesthetic further than other, other uh, segments of, of the industry. But I think it's undeniable that it is happening. Um, I think it's fair to say that, you know, patients are increasingly uh, taking control of their, their health. And um, there, everybody has gotten used to that those sleek designs that you know the semiconductor industry has given us, you know, with the cell phones and laptops. So it's very hard to separate those two now because as people demand that information in a more home care setting, um, basically they want that information to be in a format that they're familiar with with other products. So definitely products that are reaching all the way back to the home, that are digital in nature, definitely are the ones that are, uh, I say most advanced in this direction. But that being said, many other parts of the industry as well is, is starting to um, sort of embody this aesthetic as well and, and this use, user design um, uh, requirement. Are they, I, I guess, um... You know, as you said, it's a little bit slow, but are, you know, I mean, is it to the extent where, you know, people have an unboxing experience with medical products yet, or is that really only if they're to be used in the home? Well, I, there's a couple of funny little examples um, that I probably can give, you know, there's, um, a, I have a life science background. And so you can imagine one of the most dull things in the world is to get a piece of standard lab equipment uh, in, in, in your lab, right? And um, there's this one company, really small company, and they decided to just do, a, I believe it was a, a, a thermocycler, a rather, you know, simple one. It wasn't, you know, super high throughput or fancy, but they designed it to look like um, something like a, a droid from, from uh, Star Wars. And it was just amazing the response that they got from just all these people that have to live, you know, day after day using this device in the lab and they just enjoyed the aesthetic of that. And so they preferentially chose that device over something else that just looks like a square box. Um, does that happen very often? I would say no, not to that extent, but there are cases where it has and has been appreciated by, by the people who have to use them uh, day on day. Um, I think it's just fair to say that we're all human and something that just makes our day-to-day -day experience a little bit better um, has broad appeal. And that's where that comes from. Oh, thank you. Thanks for that story and that example. I think it's a perfect one. Um, you know, I've seen, I've seen images from uh, products that both of uh, both Gary and, and Young Lin that your firms have designed and, and, you know, they're beautiful um, and they have that kind of aesthetic that, that very, you know, um, sleek, um, and, and kind of comfortable experience that I think people are, are used to using and not, you know, what you would expect to see maybe in a first generation medical device that a lot of the companies, certainly on the ones on this, on this cohort here at MedTech Innovator, um, you know, their first products often are doing. But, you know, what we want to do is see if we can bring things up in terms of, of uh, the level uh, at these companies. And we want them to strive for, for that, uh, you know, that user experience that's going to be exactly what you just described, Yon, like you want people to want to use these devices um, and for them to be, you know, comfortable and to look forward to it and to think this is really, you know, enjoyable. Um, so, you know, I think that, that was a good example. Um, Gary, anything else you want to share on that topic before we move on in terms of, you know, the consumerization, if you will, of kind of even medical products? Yeah, look, I think there's certainly um, 
a lot more cultural um, and even gender awarenesses within the, um, the, the, the user um, experience space, the human factor space as well too. So increasingly it does become more important that you, you have a very good appreciation for things like your user demographic um, and you separate things like the, the user experience versus say, for instance, the purchasing decision-making experience as an example. So I think there's definitely, a, 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 it is slow as, as Yanlin was saying, but um, there is definitely an awareness that, that, that is sort of working concurrently across all consumer items. You know, certainly things like the original iPhone just raised the bar to a completely different level. Um, as far as, uh, you know, what people are expecting from the point of view of being interfaced intuitively with a product and how uh, their tolerance level for, for very bad user experience is also coming up with that as well too. So the, as you've got to be in tune with that, that, that there has to be a level of intuitiveness um, with your product. And you have to bear in mind too, just as we have with touch screens and, and, and their, um, their sort of prevalence across a lot of interfaces with devices nowadays, um, where that's working for people. Of course, for instance, you know, in a vehicle, you mentioned the automotive industry, Paul, in vehicles, you're actually seeing them transition now with um, interfaces away from touch screen because of things like reflectivity, um, dirtiness of the screen, um, just general interfacing, visual interfacing with a screen and, and having to go through different touch screens to get to a particular command or prompt um, is changing. And so whereas flat screens, you know, are still out there and still very prolific, um, they are in some instances not, not the preferred option as well too. So yes, you have to be very much in tune with just natural conventions in other markets and what human factors, um, habits and, and intuitiveness people have there in the conventions. You have to be aware of those trends when you're looking at, at your devices, but at the same time too, these cultural and gender shifts that are going out there at the moment are, are definitely very, very transitional as well too. And, and we'll see a lot of changes in those areas between the Asia region, the North America and European markets as well too, as far as human factors and, and how you need to interpret them. Yeah, you made a great point, um, Gary, there about screens. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I think about a lot when I look at products is exactly what you just said, which is that, you know, yes, a touch screen might look pretty, but the interface may not be uh, what people are used to using or maybe not optimal. I mean, maybe people don't want really want to look at the screen all that much. They just want to feel, you know, maybe there's a tactile component that's really more important. Um, I certainly know driving a car, I don't want to go look over at a big screen with a whole bunch of menus before I can get to my my option, I just want to reach over and hit the volume up button um, and not not have to look at a screen to do that. So I definitely understand what you're saying there. And obviously, you know, when it comes to devices and human factors, people need to be able to be, you know, it just needs to work and be comfortable and integrate with their workflow. Um, even if a screen is beautiful, it may not be the right, you know, might not be the right interface. Um, but one of the things that, you know, we, we talk about a lot is digital and, and the fact that, you know, maybe five years ago, um, you know, when people talked about data in healthcare, uh, data was something that was kind of like an afterthought, data was generated. Uh, and then, you know, um, or maybe your device could generate data. Um, and so people would say, okay, well, what are we gonna do with that data? Um, and, and we're finding now, you know, more increasingly that the data is what people are after. Um, and the device in some cases, not always, but the device is a means to generating data um, and you know the data is really the essential thing. So what, just as a generalism for both of you, um, I'll go back to Yanlin first again. Um, you know, is digital something that is done you know, secondarily after the design of the product or digital and, and the device design itself, is it important to do those things hand in hand at the same time from the beginning? Well, I think if you are going to have a digital aspect to your product, it has to go hand in hand. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, let's say, engineering reasons behind that statement, not just even HF ones. And some of them can be things like, where do you do your compute, right? Is it on the device, the instrument, or are you going to push out that compute onto the, the screen? Or are you going to push it into a cloud or some kind of backend server? And that has implications, you know, uh, about latency and uh, data security and all these kind of other things. So if you don't plan it from the start, especially if you do have a, let's say a hardware, software, you know, digital uh, instrument um, situation, you're gonna run into a lot of problems down the line. 
um, if, you, if you don't consider that upfront. Um, I think it's also fair to say that it, a lot of people start out and they say, you know, I can run this test on a smartphone, right? I think that's quite a common uh, statement that I get. And yeah, absolutely, you can run it on a smartphone, but do you want to run it on a smartphone? Um, you know, there are other considerations other than the fact that it exists, including things like cleanability. You know, if you're going to put hazardous waste, basically human tissue, saliva, whatever, in proximity to somebody's phone, is that really a great idea? Or do you want something, you know, slightly removed from that and then that uploads it to a console somewhere that is far removed from hazardous materials where you can actually get that data in a, in a, in a cleaner way. So there, I would say um, all those considerations, cleanability, uh, workflow, ease of use, you should plan those out first before you start building anything because the back end will be hugely affected by those upfront decisions that you make. So don't don't make it in isolation is basically what I'm, I would suggest to, to the, all the cohort. And if you have a if you have a digital team that's you know that's separate from your um, from your product team, um, mm -hmm. you better be working together. I guess yeah. that's the point, right? if you if you've outsourced part either side of that um, that work, you know you need somebody in your organization that is actually responsible for them working together. Basically responsible for the overall product, not just the digital that they've promised to do or not just the hardware that they've promised to do. Somebody has to be looking for it, looking at both and specifically where the interfaces are and clearly defining what are those interfaces. Because that's a great place for whole projects to fall down on if, if that, that those are not very clearly defined areas. Great. Um, Gary, let me, uh, let me go to you for a minute. Um, uh, so Yellen's already given us, I think, the answer to my question, which was going to be, what's the right time to begin industrial design and some of these considerations, which it sounds like it's from the very beginning before you build anything. Um, I, I assume you, you probably would agree with that. Well, look, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, the insights that you'll get from validating a lot of um, initial interfacing with your idea. Even if you've got some level of embodiment of what either the hardware or even the interface might look like, the insights you'll get by, by, by testing some of your assumptions early as best you possibly can will be invaluable throughout the entire journey that you're going on. Because ultimately that's, that's what people are, are, are interfacing with your product for. And if you don't, if you don't have that clarity and continue to to evolve um, those insights into that 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 user experience, um, then it's not it's not just a compliance thing. It's it's a, it's a success thing at the end of the day. Um, we did some work in our portfolio on a on a um, on a kinetograph for a company called GKC, which was effectively a wristwatch that measured handshaking and the onsets of Parkinson's disease, and they'd spent probably close to a million dollars plus developing the core technology to, to measure the, the shaking symptoms of the hand um, against the, the treatment and, and, uh, and, and collecting a lot of data. The fact of the matter was, is once they started doing trials, they realized that the actual form factor of the watch was completely unacceptable and the demographic who were largely older wouldn't wear the device for the amount of time that was required. And so it would get taken off and the whole diagnosis and data set was compromised. And so it sounds like a little thing, but if someone won't wear your device, for instance, and it's a wearable, then it's it's not a it's not a it's a complete fail. And and yet they'd spent a lot of money actually developing a tech. And the reason being is that they just hadn't done those early stage insights into would somebody like a big clunky white velcro um, uh, you know device bolted to their hand when they go out to dinner with family. Um, yet they would wear something that was more form, form like a watch that looked quite modern and actually did the same thing. So these are key decisions that, that you need to get those insights into early. And so when you're doing things like your product requirements, even when you're doing your pitch decks, all of these things will inform those processes. 
Yeah, no, it's a good, it's a, it's a good point. Yes, Yaman. Um, I, so, I would I would say it's fair to say that um, there is a regulatory requirement where you have to do some level of human factor studies, especially in the validation stage, and the FDA in particular is the most clear on that. They they actually name you have to do fifteen people of this type, you know, in your demographic. But earlier than that, they sort of say, do human factors and it's a guidance, right? So there's not a specific rule there. So I have seen projects come through the door where they have done very, very little upfront. You know, what Gary was talking about that really understanding the, the user needs upfront before you, you, you start actually building anything. And then they, you know, are just saying, look, I have something really basic I'm just gonna go straight to validation study because that's the only thing that I'm really required to do. Um, you know, there's a, a specific number I have to meet for that one. I think it's fair to say in our experience, we've never seen anybody who have ignored all the upfront stuff do really well in validation. So it's, it, it comes back and bites them down the line. And the thing to probably know is that even as a startup and you don't have a huge amount of resource, these formative studies, so these early stage studies, and don't have to be gigantic, but they have to be relevant for the, the, the innovation or the, the unique features that you're trying to bring to market. So talk to experience HF you know, team and they can help direct your effort into those specific areas that are high risk for your program. And that's the way that you can reduce overall risk in your program, but also cost upfront. But it saves you a lot down the line because I don't, yeah, I can't think of a single example where people just rocked up to the final validation study and did amazing if they didn't do any work before that. Yeah, no, that's a, that's, that's a, good, um, a good segue for kind of what I was, get, I was gonna ask next, which is some examples of, of poor execution. Um, that, you know, give, you know, give us some examples, you know, uh, Gary already gave us one. So maybe an example of, a, of something where someone did muck it up, um, as you said, um, and maybe without na naming the company, um, mm -hmm. just, you know, kind of give us an example of something there, you know, the kind of thing that we want our companies to avoid doing. Right. So um, I'm going to give a very old example, because again, you know, try not to name names too much. So Early part of my career, I was um, in, in ultrasound imaging uh, work. And back then it was the hot thing that what you call 3D ultrasound. And that was new and exciting. And a company launched this product and technically it was amazing. It was head and shoulders above what was existing in the market um, uh, before then. Uh, so lots of hospitals bought this new ultrasound system, it, it, it was, um, you know, warmly received from a technical aspect. Then, you know, they went in and said, okay, why are these devices not being used? You know, you bought them, why are they just sitting there? And they realized that, well, most of the people that were using these devices were women. And the, the because of the technology at the time, you know, they didn't consider that basically the wand was very large and hard to hold, one. And two, just how the buttons were laid out on the panel basically meant that if you had any sort of nail at all, long nails, you're gonna crack your nail. So preferentially, a lot of the practitioners who usually are women uh, who were using the device basically just didn't like using it. So they only used it when they had to, when they needed that special feature. But for all the standard things, they were still using all their old machines that they were familiar with. So that's the thing where, you know, technically it was awesome, it was great, um, but practically people didn't like it. Um, and, you know, some of those problems could have been solved way earlier if, you know, you did any sort of study, sort of understanding the demographic of users and the use environment that, that these machines were, were going to go into. 
Thank you. And yeah, I definitely, I can see how the cracking of the nails would not be, um, would not be um, well liked among uh, women. So that would be bad. Uh, good point. Good example on that, Yan Lin. Um, what about, um, what about COVID and how that's affecting things right now? So we talk about, you know, doing these um, user studies um, and, and that seems to imply, you know, having people go out and meet with um, people who are using your product. Um, in this COVID environment, maybe we're past it um, or not, but um, are we, uh, what are some of the ways that COVID has affected um, some of those formative studies, some of that early user work? Um, I'll start with you, Gary, on that. Uh, look, yeah, obviously from a point of view of, uh, of interfacing with people, it's not as easy as it, as it, as it was going back um, you know, six months ago to, to actually get things like focus groups and, and various other trials together. Um, it doesn't mean that, that um, there isn't ways for you to, to still utilise, you know, similar learnings as founders of, of, of your product um, and, and do some trials, even if it is internally. I mean, we, we do quite a bit, few type trials internally with, with mock-ups and, and various other, you know, test rigs prior to going anywhere near, you know, external resources or, or you know, um, research um, support um, facilities in hospitals and, and various other institutes as well too. So we'll have done a lot of internal um, testing ourselves before we go anywhere near, you know, external testing. Um, from a point of view of COVID sort of impacting that, look, um, not, not really, it hasn't really changed the processes of going through it. It's still just as critical as ever to do it. Um, the projects we're doing probably are, aren't Im impacted specifically by COVID, although there's a lot of companies getting into COVID products. Um, but look, it, it still comes back very much again to this, this, this um, gaining at least some level of insights very early into to what this offering is to an end user. Because what, what can happen, as Yanlin's already identified, is that, 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 that when you come particularly from a technology core source, and that's your inspiration, um, actually being able to just park that for a moment and, 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 and get onto other elements that are critical for the success of your product is probably the hardest thing that a lot of, a lot of founders um, struggle with, is not devaluing it, but just placing alongside some of these other key drivers for the success of your product in its in its delivery to the marketplace. Because to be perfectly honest, a lot of users will never appreciate the hard work and technology and sweat that goes into making that experience happens for them. Um, and you shouldn't expect them to, but the reality is it can be the be all and end all of your product succeeding in the marketplace. And that's often the, the difficult thing that we find is, is the, the founders transitioning through, hopefully through these types of insights of, of actually trialling it and, and testing the user experience themselves and learning about it, that they realise that maybe their technology actually isn't up to speed or maybe it isn't quick enough or maybe it's too noisy or it's too hot or whatever that might be. Um, they'll learn that very early and they'll, they'll ask different sets of questions about what their product and, and technology is actually going to be featuring. Thanks, Gary. And Yan Lin, anything you want to add from the, uh, the COVID-related question? Any, any advances or anything that happened as, happened as a result of COVID that maybe are affecting the field and are perhaps here to stay in terms of improvements? So I think um, there is some impact, but probably not as broad as you might think. So uh, we are continuing to do uh, Uh, we are we are continuing to do human factors works for our clients so work is ongoing um, the main thing that i would say is that there are certain categories of users that you we are having trouble accessing at the moment because of covid so for example categories where um, your product is addressing a need within an elderly population or immunocompromised population it's as you can imagine very hard to recruit for those participants in your studies at the moment but for many other areas where, where that's not the case, it is possible to, to run um, studies at the moment. And, and we are. There's another aspect which you know, has, has been brought up and um, I would say it's, it's not gold standard at the moment. It's not standard practice at the moment, but um, there is opportunities for discussion as, as a way forward. Um, and these are to do with more digital technologies. So uh, for example, you create a, a device that is meant for a home use scenario. 
and your validation study, you know, is to get that person in the home setting to do that test correctly. Um, there may be an opportunity there to say, let's do a remote uh, validation study where basically you have a video of somebody doing it in their home setting, which is basically the scenario that the device is supposed to met, uh, meant to go into. And that may be acceptable uh, by the regulators, but that's a case by case study. So I would say if that is something of interest to your company, speak to your regulatory uh, official, you know, the, the pre-meetings um, that the FDA offers are a great resource to discuss things like that as, as a way forward. Great, thank you for that. Uh, and moving ahead a little bit, because, you know, we have about 20 minutes left in the live broadcast, so I want to make sure we cover um, some of these additional topics. Um, one of the questions that, you know, we, we were asked by some of the companies in the cohort um, had to do with, you know, who should be who we should be studying in terms of human factors. So the question was, if there's a product that's operated by physicians in a hospital setting, should you also carry out usability evaluations with other caregivers? For example, the nurse who opens the box and the product pouch, uh, you know, and passes the sterile product to the physician, et cetera. So, you know, who, who should we be studying? Um, is it just the person who's operating the device or kind of all the people in the, in the workflow? Um, so Yan Lin. Um, you basically test the areas where there is risk, basically. So for example, if literally it's, can you open a box? That's usually not a risk. But if it is open a box and do six different steps before you can have the potential of getting the right answer, then you need to test that. So that's kind of how I would approach looking at a problem like that. What is the uniqueness in your product? Where are the high risk elements for it going wrong and impacting safety or efficacy of that product? And then that's basically where you would focus. But you can take, so a lot of times that has to do with, you know, the end point of your validation study. But to build up to that, you can test components of. So you don't have to wait to the end to, to do that. You can do, you know, let's say this is a unique feature that has not existed before. So you're implementing it into this overall system. That's obviously going to be the high risk portion because the rest is historical. You know, there is proof that people can use the other part of the machine really well. So then you just zoom in on that. Um, so yeah, I think it's case by case, but it can start from unboxing if, if that does impact the end point. And if there's risk. Yes, if there is risk. Okay. Um, and, uh, and Gary, question for you on, uh, on usability. Um, one of the questions is, um, should usability tests be completely blind? In other words, like, do you give the user the instructions for use in the product um, and see what happens? Um, or can you give them some verbal training along with the device? Look, look ideally, um, if you can make the interface with the, the device intuitive, one, one you're, you're certainly obviously um, lowering the risk that it'll be that it won't be used um, incorrectly, um, and uh, and at the same time too, look, you can generally bank on people being lazy. So you can have the best instruction book in the world, um, but you know odds on that that most people don't read it even um, you know in its fullest. So we've seen many instances where there's been very explicit instructions as to how to use a device, and 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 people still customise their interfacing with the device, and that can be. They're left, right-handed, male, female, um, good day, bad day, or they've got an armful of, of, uh, of folders and various other things, and so they're, they're, they're not using it the way that they're supposed to use it. Um, so it, it is complex. You, there has to be obviously a level of, of um, I guess, assumption on the part of the, the, uh, of the, the developers as well too as to what, what that intuitive and behavioural um, uh, situation is going to be like for the majority of the time. Um, yes, you can't pl pl please all the people all of the time. Unfortunately, that's the reality of it. Um, but again, as Jan was saying, the, the risk side of things from a compliance and a regulatory perspective, uh, that's critical. Um, on the other side of it is, um, again, a bank on intuitive. If you can make people that, that can um, interface with your device and it makes sense from a design perspective, um, then you'll find that people will just naturally gravitate to using it. 
Yeah, and, and I've heard many times um, the stories um, from all sorts of users that they just throw those instructions out. They never look at them. So, um, so I guess intuitiveness is, is really important or you can't make the assumption that people are gonna read the instructions. Um, so, you know, and, and just to make sure, you know, from the question that was asked, I wanna make sure we cover that. Um, is it okay though, to give the user some verbal coaching um, while you're doing these studies or is it better just to let them, you know, give them the device and see how they use it? Um, Your end uh, validation study, if it is meant that when you sell your product, they receive the box and that's all they get. So there is no external coaching. That is the scenario is stuck with. So in your final studies, you just have to give them the box. And if they do not read anything, that's the way that it goes. So you're stuck with it. Um, but there are obviously other product categories where you know um, training is involved before you can use that device or that instrument, at which point you give the standard training and then you have to leave the room and see if that person can, can, can do the test. But it is whatever the scenario is that the, the eventual end user will have to face. You know, you've mentioned regulatory too, um, and I didn't want to get too much into kind of the regulatory aspects um, in this particular webinar, just because of the length of time. But Yanlin, I did have one question for you, since you mentioned, you know, FDA and how it has a minimum set of you know human factors um, requirements that are part of approval um, is the same thing true in other regions um, of Asia Pacific. Um, and I, you know, Gary, you could talk about Australia, yeah, you know, or or you could talk broadly in Yanlin um, as well. Um, so I'll start with you, Gary. Um, is the uh, do we find the same kind of requirements for human factors now for regulatory approval um, in in Australia and other regions? Look, I would say that they're similar. Uh, if, not, if not the same, certainly the, the Australian TGA standards are, are closely honed to the European um, European standards, more so than the North American standards. But most developers here in the Asia, uh, the Asia Pacific region, and particularly here in Australia, are targeting the North American market with their, their offering anyway. And so they will typically try and um, try and comply with uh, with with both or or either anyway. Um, Look, I, I, I'm not, again, without going into the regulatory environment um, to, to a, a large degree, um, it, it is it is obviously critical that you do understand that as part of the as part of the process of of um, doing the human factors that you understand those elements, and they're going to increasingly become more stringent because they are realising just how critical it is for those human factors standards to be you know, properly applied. Um, but you'll find that again, it does come back to they they aren't. They're, they're intuitive. They, they make a lot of sense when you actually do read between the lines as to why these the, these types of um, uh, compliance factors are in place and guidances are in place. Um, and uh, you'll find that if they're not exactly the same verbatim between the two different um, uh, regions, that, that the underlying uh, uh, the underlying drivers are very same. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, and then anything you want to add about uh, any other regions, could be China or anywhere else. Um, I would say just watch out for what, what kind of data that they're willing to accept. So usually if you do a, you know, FDA style um, dossier, usually you can use a lot of that same information basically for a CE mark, you know, so European, uh, but it's not necessarily true the other way around because the United States requires validation studies to be in population in the US mm -hmm. um, and various other countries have similar requirements with their, their uh, clinical data. So I would watch out for that. Uh, and that's a country by country uh, basis. I would say generally speaking, um, the FDA right now is probably the most explicit with what they are looking for in, in a human factors regulatory context. But um, most, as, as Gary said, most other countries are coming out of that mark pretty quickly. So if you have a product that you're developing that has a, a long lead time, you know, long life cycle expectation, um, definitely don't overlook it just because you think maybe my first market doesn't meet this level of uh, regulatory requirement. It's still very good practice um, to, to do a lot of this HF user-centric design up front. Great. Um, and, and one of the other things I know we've, we've gotten questions about is, um, is kidding. 
uh, and providing packaging for a device by itself um, or as part of a kit that includes all the accessories that are re required in the procedure. So um, maybe you could just tell us, you know, kind of, you know, your thoughts on um, for a novel device, is it good to have a kit that has all the required things or, um, or should you just do the device on its own and then tell people what else they're going to need? Um, Gary? Look, it, it, it's, it, it's not a one size fits all. Um, you know, commercially, it, it, if you can provide people with packaging kits and kit form um, and it fits in with the, the actual user experience in, in um, either storage or unpacking that kit and, and or taking it home portability. So there's various elements of that use case scenario that you need to weigh up to find out whether, whether it's a relevant issue to supply a kit. Now, typically, you'd sort of think commercially um, it'd make more sense, you know, more, more is more as opposed to, to less is more. Um, but uh, again, it, it, it is going to depend on the different scenarios. Um, from, a, from a regulatory point of view, um, there are associated components as part of that, um, that, that kit, then yes, you, you probably won't have any choice in, this, in it at all. Um, uh, we've done several items that, that have been provided to clients in a kit. A lot of the ones, particularly um, when it comes to patients and in-home care, um, kits, kits are probably essential and, and packaging demands as far as actually being able to, to transit that, uh, that item safely and, and, uh, and uh, pack it up and use it, et cetera. That, you know, that, that, that scenario does change and you do need to, to consider that as well too. Again, it comes down to whether this, this, this unit is going to be packed up after each time where people are going to pack, you know, uh, uh, pack any other elements of that um, that uh, system as opposed to a device, and 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 how they're going to interface with them as far as cleaning, as far as packing them away afterwards. There's a lot of considerations that that are multiplied when you start providing people with a kit. So it's not really a one size fits all, um, it, but but I would certainly say definitely. Again, coming back to my point is that if you if you walk yourself through um, the, that, that use cycle of the component, you'll get a lot of insights as to whether, you know, that particular offering is a better offering for your market and, and you are providing a, a holistic offering rather than a half an offering. Thanks, Gary. Uh, one of the things I know that I, I like to um, try and think about with our companies a lot is how to do these things, um, you know, at, a, at the highest quality but lowest cost way possible. Um, a lot of the startups you know, whether they're on our program or not, are out there and they're trying to, uh, you know, put everything they can into the product. And then, you know, anything that they see as, you know, as um, nice to have, they try, you know, to, to wait till later when maybe they have more money. Um, so, and obviously I'm not saying the human factors or usability are um, nice to haves, but, you know, from a, a way of bringing down costs, what are some of the things that, um, you know, that you've seen medical device companies or, or diagnostic and others do to bring down costs in terms of usability testing um, while not compromising the quality they might need for regulatory submissions. Um, so any advice, Jan, when you might give people? Um, you can do small iterative studies and you can do them pretty early on. So, you know, before you necessarily have the products, so you spent all the money prototyping, you can get quite a lot of insight from block, you know, foam blocks. So you can say, how would you interact with something of this shape if it had to live in a certain environment? So you can imagine that's particularly important in a, a like say in an OR setting where, you know, space on a cart it, it is very, very uh, important. So there's things like that that you can do upfront, small iterative things to just test some of those hypotheses up front. Um, and you can do it as well. Well, it, it really depends. So if it is a feature that is, let's say, um, not greatly impacted by say, uh, body type or, or the, the, the specific gender of the person using it, for example, then you can say, okay, I, I want to do you know, six people for this formative study. But I'm going to start with two to test out this hypothesis. I'm going to iterate before I do the next two. And you can kind of get away with that if, you know, that feature that you're testing doesn't have a large amount of variability um, uh, that gets impacted by basically differences in character 
like body type and things like that. So it really depends, but I think small and often and early is better than large and late because the correction factor there becomes uh, very, very difficult. I like it, good tips. Um, uh, Gary, um, as we're kind of in the last five minutes or so of the live broadcast, um, I want to see from you, you know, any particular um, suggestions or advice or tips that you, um, that you want to share um, with, uh, with the people who are listening um, in general. Um, and also, you can tell us how to contact you um, for the people who are just listening on YouTube so they make sure uh, they're able to contact you and get in touch with you. So, Gary, I'll start with you. I suppose if there's there's one um, lesson that I've learned and I've always tried to share with founders is um, when you're doing any sort of um, trials, be they um, interactive trials or internally, it's it's like any research project, I guess, is try to have an understanding of, of what you're trying to really trying to find out. So obviously there's all of the regulatory compliance and stipulations around that. I'm just saying above and beyond that, when you're doing these trials, really have some have some thought in advance to what you're trying to learn through that trial you know is it really about how people are unpacking it is it about the user journey all the way through or is there specifically some instance be it risk driven or you know a, a particular key of your technology and your offering that that must you must nail for this product to succeed um, going to a trial with a view to, to sort of focusing on, on learning about whether that's actually valid. And we find a lot of people when they do their trials, they don't tend to actually plan them other than actually a time and a place and a type of a person. And they, they don't seem to do an awful lot around really what they're trying to learn and did they actually, did they actually um, achieve that. So I would suggest certainly, you know, give, plan it. You know, really give some strategic thought to what you're trying to learn through a particular um, human factors trial. Um, and again, if it's to be ranked by hierarchy of risk or a marketed feature or, or a particular feature of your product, then just, you know, highlight that and say, we really want to test that. If we get that right and we, we learn from around that one feature, it'll be a, a successful test. Other than, yes, it worked, they did what they thought we did or they didn't and we, we changed the product accordingly. So that would that'll probably be my key takeaway is to, to give it, to understand it and then and then strategically plan it throughout the process of product development and refinement. Um, if you want to contact me, look, feel free, uh, our website, I'm sure Paul and, uh, and Frederick and the team could, could give you all our details if you wanted to reach out to them. But, but certainly um, our website, um, design-industry.com.au has got a plethora of projects that you can see where we've delivered products to our clients. Um, more than happy to have that conversation with you. Terrific. Thank you, Gary and Yan Lin. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, please reach out to, to info at cambridgeconsultants.com. You know, there's a contact page on, on the website. You can mention me if you want to speak to me uh, specifically uh, or reach out on, on LinkedIn. I'm on that platform as well. So always happy to have um, conversations with innovators. Thank you, Jan Lennon. Any other any other, any other closing tips from you? Um, when I talk to my clients, and I'm talking first conversation, so I've just met you, and you tell me you have this amazing invention, and one of my first question is, you know, what are your design inputs, right? And when I say that, or what are your specifications, right? I don't mean just technical specifications. For a product to really come together and and make sense, it not only has to have the technical as aspect that's very important, but it needs to also have the commercial side. It needs to have the regulatory requirements, and it needs to have the user requirements. So all those things have to come together before you can even start embodying on in, in sort of visioning what this product could look like. Um, that's probably the, the mistake that I see the most often in, in early stage companies. They come to me and say, build me a prototype. Here's my technical spec. Don't build anything until you know what you're building. Because it's really expensive to build something and then have to course correct. It's much better you do the thinking upfront. Thinking is cheap. 
uh, you know, so you spend your time doing the thinking first and then build. And a big part of that is thinking about who is going to use it at the end of the day. And I don't mean just the doctor who is going to use it in a day. It could be the nurse practitioner, it could be a laboratorian, it could be the patient. How are all those different people down the line impacted by your device? And once you have a good view of that, you're at a good position to really start thinking, okay, how does this technology need to be embodied? Great advice and a perfect way to close this up, Younglin. So uh, thank you for that. Um, well, terrific job. Uh, you guys had a great set of insights for, uh, for us today. So I really appreciate that. I think it did a really good job too of just kind of setting the stage for um, understanding how um, companies in general should be thinking about the design process, using, you know, thinking about usability, human factors, and that it's not just something that you should think about later on late and large, as you said, Jan Lin, you know, um, that is not the solution, much better to do it small and early um, and, uh, and iterate. So, you know, great advice. Um, and just in general, really appreciated the discussion and the conversation. So thank you guys very much. Um, really enjoyed it. Uh, so as uh, we always do, um, I'm gonna just make sure I point out again that um, we're gonna spend the next 30 minutes privately. So panelists, um, please stay on and startups, please stay on as well um, and scale up to our uh, part of our cohort. Um, we're going to end the YouTube live stream. So just a reminder for you, those of you on YouTube that you can go to medtechinnovator.org slash APAC live for a full list of all of our webinars. You can see the archives of the broadcasts we've already done as well as the ones that are coming up. Um, so make sure you do that. You can also subscribe to our list so you can get notified in advance before these come out. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the YouTube stream. Everyone who's watching on YouTube, have a great day.